Thanks for joining us today on Dream Farm. And we've got an uh, action-packed episode today. Uh, we think it's pretty exciting and action-packed anyway, but we're a little bit biased. Um, we're gonna spread lime and fertilizer on this half acre clover plot behind us. But I wanna talk about all the updates so far on the habitat projects and the pasture renovation on this farm. We're at that point now where things are starting to grow and it's kind of fun to see what's working, what's not, what's gonna need you know, some maintenance. Um, I think the whole story of the, of the changeover or the development of this property as a hunting property should be fun to follow through. Dream Farm is brought to you by Whitetail Institute Food Plot Blends, the Hunt Stand Pro Whitetail App, and Hoyt Archery. So let's talk first about the, uh, the updates. We had a bunch of projects and just a, a few episodes ago, we were talking about planting browse and we had put in red osier into some of the lower areas and in one upland area just to see what it would do uncaged untubed unprotected uh, versus our deer population uh, we put in wild plum and we put in choke cherry hybrid willow hybrid willow down along the road uh, hybrid poplar in those areas along the driveway where the banks were sloughing mm -hmm. trying to create some root structure there just to, to uh, stabilize that. But then we have also the work that we did uh, back in November of last year with the direct seeding of acorns. And uh, those spots are finally just starting to show, you know, a little bit of progress. So we'll start with that one. We, we will touch on this a lot more in a detailed episode in the future where we'll get really into this whole concept of direct seeding acorns. I don't want to touch on it too soon because I want to see what the final outcome is. We're just seeing the very start of it now. Uh, the soil temperature during the middle of the day is pushing 60 degrees on warm days. So the average has to be lower because then the evenings, you know, it gets cooler. So these trees aren't popping yet. We did get a nice rain. Uh, I would say within a week, get these soil temperatures up a little bit. We got the moisture now. Uh, we should see tons of, of small oak uh, coming up. And I'll talk about the whole management project of you know when we planted how we planted how many seeds per acre you know how to maintain uh, weed control all of that but first I want to make sure that we can point to a real result and say this actually worked I've been very surprised not surprised very pleased with the result of planting the plum and the choke cherry and the red osier uh, doesn't look like we lost hardly any trees at all to shock and maybe it's too early for that but uh, Deer haven't touched them. The deer haven't even touched the red osier yet, and they're really starting to throw out leaves. They're doing a lot better in the swampy area, which is what everybody would have predicted. But even on that little bit, a little bit more of an upland spot, they're starting to put leaves out, which shows that you know the roots are are doing their job. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be interesting to see because that was really an experiment to find out how we could repopulate some of these really steep areas on the farm or the really boggy areas. The boggy areas with the red osier and the steep areas where we'd have to hand plant something. You know, we can, we can burn them, we can try to see what prairie remnant comes in, but it could be years before anything results from that. Mm -hmm. So having a, a fallback to find out, can we go in with high numbers of these seedlings, hand plant them, not tube them, not protect them, and uh, get them past the deer? Uh, so far, so good. What's the survival rate you're kind of expecting on those hand-planted trees? There's two hurdles we have to overcome yet. Uh, the first one is once the deer kind of figure out that they're there. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a ton of deer, which is good. I mean, that's been the goal and, and you know, long-term we're gonna try to hold it there uh, because you can grow stuff when you don't have a ton of deer. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, uh, the other hurdle, the deer is, is one. The other hurdle is competition and the drought. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we haven't done anything to remove competition from those environments. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect world right now. It's still wet. You know, it just came off dormancy. Um, but you come back in July when the grasses are two feet tall and it's, you know, no rain for the last three weeks. You know, will these trees survive? And, and my guess is that if we hit one of those years, our survival rate will be really low, uh, less than a half. Uh, 
The red osier should do good because it's going to be in those wet spots, but the plum and the choke cherry will get, um, they'll get beat up pretty bad. Is that specifically if it's a drought year this year or even mm -hmm. in future years? Because if they make it past this year, they've probably got a pretty decent shot at yeah. making it. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. And, and what we can do too, I hate to do it if we're planting, you know, 10 or 15,000 trees, but we got a thousand trees out. You know, we could go through and uh, try to work around certain areas by spraying herbicides mm -hmm. that might remove some of the competition. We have to do some research there, but the goal was to find out, is there a low maintenance, inexpensive way to do this? Mm -hmm. Or is hand planting trees always gonna be, you know, pain and suffering? Uh, I mean, it is pain and suffering, but is there a benefit or not? Right, yeah, yeah, because if we can get it to work, you know, with uh, the way we're doing it now, we can just blow it out across big areas of the farm. Right. You know, because there's government uh, cost share money available to do this. So we don't, uh, you know, we don't have to come up with all of it out of pocket. Right, for it, only the price of your labor. Yeah, which it seemed like it was kind of expensive to me <laughs> this past year because that was a lot of work. But, because uh, we had a thousand trees and I thought, oh, a thousand trees, we can slap those in the ground. It took uh, like two weeks before they were all. Yeah. Planted. Every time we'd be on the drive up and be like, oh, I still have some trees left to plant. Yeah, and, and fortunately it stayed cool and we kept them shaded and cool. And then towards the end, I was putting them in buckets of water. Yeah, I was gonna say, it was kind of interesting because they were able to keep for quite a while yeah. in buckets in the garage. Yeah, 10 days. I think from the time we got delivery of the trees until the last ones went in the ground was probably 10 days. Yeah. And they were still viable in the end. Which is surprising. That's longer than I would have expected. Yeah, me too. And I think the key was it was cool mm -hmm. and we kept them moist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's that part of the update. The habitat part, uh, the pasture renovation, we took the area, if you remember back to uh, the late season hunts, even in November, Jordan was hunting a lot from a really small food plot up on a ridge and it was tucked back into some pasture. Well, all that pasture now is crop field and uh, they got the corn in the ground. Uh, that's gonna look so much different. And then the areas that they didn't plant, and, and I think we got enough drone footage to show it, but some parts of that are just absolutely chock full of apple trees. Mm -hmm. Amazing. How and even many acres would you say additionally that they farmed this year that was pasture last year? Probably 25. Because you said the whole area up on top is 45. Four. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So we're going to leave that fringe between the crop fields and the timber. You know, I thought about trying to do some kind of a habitat project in there, whether it's direct seeding or whatever, but there's so many apple trees coming up in there. There's the ones you can see right now that are blooming, the mature ones, but there's tons and tons of like five and six foot tall trees that the cows have been eating off. Mm -hmm. They just have not really gotten a chance to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give it two years, just watch that, maybe pull uh, some of the multiflora rows out of there, give the apple trees the best opportunity. Then after two years, we'll decide what to do, but we might have you know, 20 acres of, of apples, mm -hmm. solid. You know, just right now there's probably 150 trees. Um, mature trees. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe not quite that many, but there might be 300 immature trees up there. And it can be kind of hard to get them to that stage when there's a lot of deer anyways, right? Mm -hmm. So kind yeah. of, because I remember, I think in Southern mm -hmm. Iowa, we planted apple trees mm -hmm. once and the deer just annihilated them. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, the only thing we had here was the cattle, mm -hmm. you know, and the deer, is, the, the numbers aren't here. So anyway, if you take anything away from this habitat discussion, it's probably going to be that if you don't have a ton of deer, you can do a lot of stuff. And if you've got a ton of deer, you're really limited because the deer becomes such a factor in eating the stuff that you're planting. Another concept that you've touched on in a couple of episodes that I think is interesting is what you can sneak past them before they mm -hmm. learn what it is. Like you talked about yeah. it with sorghum and then today with like the red osier trees and stuff. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting thought that if they aren't used to it, mm -hmm. you can get away with it more than if it's something that's native to their habitat yeah. that they're used to. Well, and they get a habit. They, they start knowing where the food plots are. They know if it's corn, I can eat the ears when they silk. Mm -hmm. They get ahead of your curve. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a lot of deer where they have to get ahead of your curve, um, you can still support a reasonable number and do it in a good way. Mm -hmm. It's just as soon as you get too many deer and they got to eat everything, mm -hmm. then, then they figure it out and then they stay ahead of you. Right. And it's just really tricky because the deer are creatures of habit. You think, oh, they're going to walk through and eat all this and... They only eat the stuff that they know. Right, and they only branch out into the stuff 
that they wouldn't normally eat if they don't have enough of what they like or right, what, they, what know. they know. That's yeah. right. So the trick is to find that balance. And on this farm, we have a chance to do that. You know, on the Southern Iowa farm, it was way too late by the time we bought it. It was way overpopulated before we even owned it. Um, so uh, let's get to what we're doing here. And I've got the, the soil report. And this is the one that's the field behind us. And we used Jordan's Garmin watch and the fact that I was spreading about a 25 foot roughly band of, of seed and we mapped out exactly how much we put in and we came up with a half an acre. So we're gonna fertilize a half an acre based on the Whitetail Institute's uh, recommendations for fertilizing their Imperial Whitetail Clover. And it's coming up good, we'll show you that real quick too, but um, this one was six and a half pH, which is a little bit low for clover. It likes, you know, seven, which is neutral. So we're gonna put, the recommendation was 1,250 pounds per acre of lime. Well, we're doing a half an acre so we're dropping that down to six, 600, but, and here's the, the kind of the interesting part maybe we can, we can uh, teach, but we're using pelleted lime, and that's a little bit more concentrated, a little bit more soluble. And I asked uh, Paul Potter, who wrote the program for uh, uh, Plot Perfection, that's Whitetail Institute's app, and it's really pretty cool. I mean, I spent a lot of time on the phone with him. He walked me through it, and there's a lot of really good features in there, so check that out. Uh, we'll put a link in the description, uh, plotperfection.com, I think. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's a cool app. But any, he said that pelleted lime is about 80%. You need about 80% as much mm -hmm. as you would if it was the, the ground limestone ag lime. So we're putting in 500 pounds of pelleted lime on a half an acre. So That's surprising to me too because you'd think that if it's the finer ground, it would be more soluble. But if it's the pellet, it's but more soluble? The, the, the pellet is fine ground and then compressed into pellets. Oh, I see. Yeah, so it's probably even more finely ground. Uh, so the, the ag lime is just raw limestone. Uh, this is limestone that's, I don't know if it's combined in some kind of a additional, you know, whatever. But probably more pure than just regular limestone. I don't know. Yeah, we're just making stuff up now. Don't listen to me. <laughs> it's 80%. You only need 80% as much. Jordan will go back to college and get yeah. a degree in ag before she takes over this. Uh, so if we're putting it into imperial clover, it says we need 15 pounds nitrogen because of our soil test where we came back at and uh, 60 per acre of phosphate. So N15 P60 K0 because we had a lot of, of uh, potassium in the soil. And so, this is specifically, you're only putting this down on the strip where you planted mm -hmm. the clover, you're That's, not doing the rest of the field? No, because we're gonna plant something else in the rest of the field. Right. We'll come back to that later. Right. Okay, so we're really trying to make that middle part, like that drive-through lane where we're gonna have the clover, mm -hmm. is being like as good as we possibly can mm -hmm. for the clover. Mm -hmm. So we're actually putting in more than it, than it asks for because it was easier just to pick it up at the co-op in, in a bulk bag. So we're gonna put in roughly 100, is that right? Yes. Yes, we're gonna double it. We're putting in 100 pounds of, uh, on, on half an acre. So that'd be like the same as putting 200 pounds on an acre. So we're putting 100 pounds on a half an acre and it's gonna be, I think it's, it's called MAP. I think it's uh, like 15 or 18 N and like 55 P and zero K. So it's gonna be double that. So we're gonna have more than enough in, and we're gonna have about 100, 100 to 120. So you're saying 100 P. pounds of the mix, not of one specific mineral? Right, but right. The, the mix has those Right, 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 yeah. but I was thinking you were putting like 100 pounds of phosphate or something. No. Okay, no. 100 pounds of the combined. Yeah, the map is, is like 18.550 okay. or something. So if I put 100 pounds of that on a half an acre, it's like right. doubling it Right. Uh, because you're you know, your, your actual is gonna go up. Right. And again, you go to that Plot Perfection app and it'll go through all the fertilizer calculations for you too, which is pretty cool. Um, so the only downside to MAP, and I didn't realize it until now, is that it's a little bit acidic. It forms an acidic solution. DAP would be better, but I didn't, I don't know if the co-op had that or not. I didn't even think about it. What's DAP? DAP is another uh, formulation that's like a little bit higher nitrogen uh -huh. and then uh, about the same P and then no K. So because lime is a base? Lime is a base. So lime tries to bring the pH up. Right. And now we're putting fertilizer on this, trying to bring the pH back ah, down. I so, it, you know, and I don't think it's like one to one. I mean, I know we're, we're like way 
exceeding whatever acidic nature that the, the MAP fertilizer has to it with putting all this, this uh, limestone down. But, you know, in hindsight, you know, if I could have known that, I would have got something that didn't turn acidic because uh, it kind of fights against that, that goal of bringing the pH up. Right. Okay. It's enough talk. Whew. I don't even know if half of what we said is true. I was just kind of making it up as I went along. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely know if it grows or not because, yeah. I mean, it looks pretty good now. We'll show you yeah. close-ups of it. But, uh, yeah, I'll come back and close after we get this project done. And uh, it's exciting when we see these projects actually working mm -hmm. on the farm. Uh, that really gets us fired up. So, uh, yeah, let's get this work finished up. And then, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll come back and close. That was a lot of lime. Uh, I guess I underestimated how many trips that was gonna take. I should have gone a lot slower on the first couple of trips, but uh, it'd be a lot easier doing using it, this kind of spreader than one of those bag spreaders over your shoulder. <laughs> I think you could do the fertilizer that way, but you would not wanna do the lime that way. You know, they make even bigger stuff like three-point hitch spreaders that run off the power takeoff of a tractor. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty nice for spreading lime. But uh, this thing worked. Yeah. I mean, it's a half an acre. If I was doing a lot more than a half an acre, we would have had to, you know, had to scale up somehow. But uh, I guess that's it for today's episode, right? Can you think so. of anything else we need to talk about? You had some ideas about a mm. pontoon boat yes. to put out on the river. My uh, latest idea, and dad is not quite on board with this one, I don't think. I haven't quite figured it out, but. I want to get a pontoon and I want to take it out on the river because the Mississippi River is like half a mile away. Right over there. Yeah, like there are boat landings and sloughs a quarter mile from our driveway. Right over there. Yeah, <laughs> so it just seems like a real shame that I'm floating on an inflatable floaty yeah. in a pond with two inches of water when the Miss mighty Mississippi is just right there. So yeah. I want to get a boat and I want to take advantage of it. And I said we can get like a kind of rough, cheap one and I'll, I'll learn how to fix it up. Right, she was going to fix it up. That was the part that I didn't quite get. I'm going to figure it a, out. I had a really bad feeling about that. It was the, the whole pontoon boat thing. I was okay. And then she got to the, I'm going to get a rough one and I'm going to fix it up. And I thought, okay. It would be a good learning experience. <laughs> yeah, for, for me especially. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for today. We're going to call it off there before Jordan has any other ideas. <laughs> but we appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Dream Farm. And remember to always... Dream big. Big pontoon. Big pontoon.